It is indeed my pleasure to be here tonight with Alyssa Ayers, who's a senior fellow with the Council on Foreign Relations, the co-sponsor with the World Affairs Council. And uh, she's here to talk about this splendid new book, which I'll just put up here on the table so you can all see it. Um, she is a senior, like I say, a senior fellow with, uh, for India, Pakistan, and South Asia with the Council on Foreign Relations. And her work at CFR focuses on India's role in the world and U.S. relations with South Asia. Before that, she served as a Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for South Asia during the Obama administration, providing policy directions for four U.S. embassies and four consulates. Her first book, Speaking Like a State, focuses on the nationalism, culture, and politics of Pakistan. And she's also co-editor of three books on the region and India and India foreign policy. She's a recipient of numerous awards, and she speaks fluent Hindi and Urdu. We couldn't be more fortunate, really, to have someone other than Alyssa here with us tonight. And really, I have to say, your book is about India's time has come. Our time has come to hear from you. So we, we are here to talk about India, and India is indeed a rising power. If you look at its economic prowess, and you look at its um, what's happening in the technology, looking at Bollywood, it's already at the table in that respect. Influential power um, on climate change, and it has a huge military, regional power. It's ready to set its own terms for being at the table. And I'd like to hear how you came to the conclusion that India is ready. What prompted that? What led you to the basic thesis of your book and, and your thinking? Thank you. Thanks for the wonderful introduction and for a, a, an excellent question to kind of tee up the framework of the book. Um, I have been working on foreign policy and U.S. policy toward India for many years now, and it has been the case, certainly, and as I, I chart out in the book, uh, India's political leaders have for decades sought to position India as a major power on the world stage. That has been one of India's longstanding ambitions. Uh, the size of the country, its democratic accomplishments, over the decades, maintaining a democracy against the odds, uh, as many would say. But I think there is also a sense in which India has felt excluded and remains on the outside of some of the major institutions of global governance. I hope we can talk a little bit more about that in some detail. But one of the things that has been uh, particularly noteworthy over, let's say, the past 10 to 15 years has been the quite dramatic growth of the Indian economy. Uh, India is now the world's seventh largest economy at market exchange rates. It has been for about the last three years. The Indian economy is larger than the economies of Canada and Italy, both of which are members of the group of seven, the G7, yet India is not a member of the group of seven. So I think you start to look at some of these markers of how the world coordinates its global engagement, its foreign policy conversations and consultations, uh, where India is. There is a very realistic possibility that by the end of this calendar year, according to some projections, the Indian economy may overtake the size of the economies of the UK and France, which would make India the world's fifth largest economy. So it will become harder, I think, for people not to notice that India has really emerged in a very real sense as uh, a power with heft on the world stage. Now, India still faces challenges gaining access and membership to some of these important institutions of global governance that certainly concern. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have seen a, a bit of a shift in India to uh, looking to become a more active player on many different kinds of global consultations, many different types of issues. I'm happy to go into some examples on that front in a way that wasn't the case 20 years ago. So uh, the, the title of my book is uh, a quote. It's not me speaking. It's a quote from both the current Indian Prime Minister, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, as well as the previous Indian Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh. And to me, it's quite striking that the, the two Prime Ministers who couldn't be more different and who come from different parties have both at different times said, our time has come hmm. for India's role on the world stage. Uh, so that that is why I took that as the title. I think it sends a signal about where India's own ambitions are across political parties uh, for where India would like to be placed on the world stage. Yeah. Well, as you point out, the economy really is growing, I think, at a 7% click 
really, and, and looks to be able to sustain that going forward. But is it a, is it, why hasn't it happened before now? Is it a question of leadership within India? Is it, did it take um, prim, former Prime Minister Singh and now Prime Minister Modi to as make the assertion? Or is there, are there other reasons that are constraining India, or is it a combination of the two? Constraining where India is placed globally, right. is that what you mean? Right. Yeah. With its opportunity. You yeah. say it's not a member of the G7, et cetera. It's not a member of APEC. Yeah, India continues to face um, some pretty substantial challenges in gaining membership and access to a lot of these different institutions. So on the one hand, uh, I argue in the book that India is now closer today to being a global power than at any time in its recent past. Uh, I think the economic case is quite clear. It's also true that India faces many domestic challenges. It has a lot of domestic vulnerabilities. Those are well known, and they very often occupy the front pages of our news. And so I think that has in many ways overshadowed what India is doing on the world stage because people don't necessarily know about it. I think if you were to grab somebody on the street and say, what are the world's top economies, I'm not sure people would include India among them. They just might not know. Mm. If you were to grab somebody on the street and say, you know, name the world's top 10 auto producing countries, I'm not sure people would have India on the list, but it's true. Um, so I, I think in the sense of what India has done and developed economically, certainly its time has come. I think you can make that case. Where India needs some help is on this issue of global governance and mm. these institutions that are very slow to reform. Uh, it's very difficult to envision fast reform of the UN Security Council. I don't think we should give up. I don't think we should not try just because it's difficult. Uh, but I do think that this is a, a challenge for India. Um, and it's one of the reasons that I spend some time talking about reform of global governance, uh, precisely because that's an area where I think the United States can be helpful. So global governance, the driver to bring India to those tables, would be external to India. Yeah. So, and that would be, for example, membership in the UN Security Council? Is that where it would start? If or Well, that will be a long time coming. I think we should try to do more than we have been on that front. The United States has a declared foreign policy that does support Indian membership in, quote, a reformed and expanded UN Security Council. That was a statement made by former President Barack Obama when he visited India in November of 2010. Mm. Uh, he made that statement of support in an address that he gave before India's parliament. Now, we as a country have not done very much on Security Council reform in the intervening years. Mm -hmm. It's partly because Security Council reform is really hard. It's mm -hmm. also because nobody can decide which countries should be part of an expansion, should there be veto powers, how do you match a slate of countries so you have good representation from around the world. So a lot of this has produced complete stasis, mm -hmm. uh, even though if you were to t take a look at the five permanent members today, it doesn't represent the distribution of power in the world today. So it's quite clear it's anachronistic. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a, a long-term challenge that I think the United States should work on. India is, is doing what it can with it, the three partners that have grouped together uh, in what's called the G4, the group of four, that is uh, seeking Security Council reform and seeking their own permanent membership on it. That includes mm -hmm. Japan, Germany, and Brazil. Uh, but there are other institutions that I think would be quite important to see India gain membership. I've written uh, a lot, both within this book and in other uh, writing formats, about APEC, the Asia-Pacific mm -hmm. Economic Cooperation Forum. Here's a group that is focused on promoting and expanding free trade and investment across mm -hmm. the Asia-Pacific region. You know, India is Asia's third largest economy. Guess who this year's APEC summit host is? <laughs> Nobody will guess, so I'll tell you. Papua New Guinea, which has an economy of $20 billion. Now, that's great that they're going to host this year, but it does point out, I think, a real anomaly that an economy that's so small and is not shaping the world uh, is a member, and yet India has had this pending membership request for more than 20 years, and it has an economy that is approaching $2 trillion. Mm -hmm. So that takes us back internally to the country and where the drivers could be, uh, where the drivers are directing the, the, the country politically and economically to justify having a seat at the table. And to, uh, it has to, th those, th that leadership within, the, within India has got to deal with a history that is not really in step with 
India's time has come to take a place at the global table. They've gone, they've positioned themselves in a very different way from the time of independence going forward. So mm -hmm. can you speak a little bit of the contrast historically, what was versus what is now and how we might have, how India might have gotten from, from that point to this point. And I might add a lot of your experience in India is covers that stretch, not all the way back to independence, of course, 1947, but from 1991 and the reforms forward. So how do you square what was with what you're saying is in terms of your book? Yeah. On the economic front, there has been a big change in India since mm -hmm. the economic opening that took place in the summer of 1991. And I write about that in my book because I think it's been a very important moment in shaping the way India engages in trade negotiations, in developing its own internal mm -hmm. policy measures that govern uh, appropriate levels of foreign direct investment and uh, foreign institutional investment. Um, India had previously had uh, a, a very limited engagement with external economies. Uh, it was, you know, many people have referred to most of post-independence India as an autarkic economy. Mm -hmm socially planned with a planning commission that developed five-year plans for uh, what should be happening economically and how to funnel uh, national funds to different states and what they should be doing with it. This was a, a planned economy. Um, there was a balance of payments crisis in 1991, and India began to open up. And this was a, a moment of crisis in India, and yet it unleashed what has been an important uh, era of economic growth for India. Now, does that mean that that all economic reform is pretty much done? Well, no. Uh, there's still some things that could be done that could help the Indian economy uh, grow faster, go farther, do much more, create more jobs. Uh, a lot of the reforms that remain are politically difficult to do. Labor reform is tough to do in any country. Look at the problems that France is having uh, carrying out labor reform. These are hard anywhere because you have different interest groups that say, well, wait a minute, this is going to hurt us. This won't be fair. How do you manage this? How do you deal with it? In democracies, people have to be responsive to voters. And so India, it, it, of course, is not always able to implement a kind of immediate reform plan and carry it through the way a country that doesn't have to be responsive to voter interests may uh, be able to do here. Mm -hmm. Obviously, China is the example. Um, so, so a lot has changed in India. Um, there has been a history, of course, of India being a tough trade negotiator internationally. It probably won't surprise anybody who follows any of these issues. Uh, and I think that has cast a little bit of a shadow for India with external partners on um, the question of whether to champion Indian membership in some of mm. these kinds of organizations. It's certainly the case, I think, with the question of membership in APEC, where you'll hear experts say, well, gosh, this is a, an organization that works by consensus. If, if India joins, will we still be able to take decisions by consensus, or uh, will India say, well, no, we don't agree with that, we're going to walk away, as happened in the case of the World Trade Organization Doha Round in the summer of 2008 for I example. That. Yeah, mm -hmm. a lot of people remember that. So mm -hmm. th these kinds of things do cast a shadow on the decisions that external partners make about membership and gaining access to that sort of seat at the global table. But is there something in the Indian political character that has to be overcome or that has been overcome? Uh, has this notion of non-alignment politically, geopolitically, has India left that behind? Apparently, you think it has, and the, hence the book. Yes, I, so uh, non-alignment was really important for India through most of its independent history. Um, India was a, a co-founder, uh, a longtime supporter of the non-aligned movement. I think one of the aspects of the non-aligned movement that we don't talk about as much in the United States was the degree to which non-alignment often meant alignment away from the United States. We as a power were kind of the most aligned aligned. Um, for India that meant a, a great support and a defense partnership with Russia, which remains to this day. 
what I think you have seen happen now with India is a gradual willing to partner more closely with the United States. We've overcome these decades of, of what other historians have referred to as uh, estranged democracies uh, and crafted a much stronger strategic partnership. But that doesn't mean that India wants to be a U.S. ally. India doesn't want the United States to be its only partner on mm -hmm. the world stage. It has strategic partners with uh, many different countries. No alliance. I mean, the, I think you make the distinction yes. between partner alliance versus affiliate or whatever the I think this is term is. An absolutely crucial distinction. I think that we in the United States need to to manage our expectations and understand very carefully that we can deepen our partnership with India. Uh, but we should not expect that New Delhi is interested in signing up for everything that we Americans do on the world stage uh, because they are not interested in everything that we do on the mm -hmm. world stage. I think we're going to have some areas of disagreement, even though we're going to increasingly have areas where we're partnering and working more closely together. So we have a lot of convergence, for example, on some of the security issues mm -hmm. in the larger Asia Pacific region. But we have some differences over Iran. And we have some continued differences over Russia. Uh, so I think that what, one of the things I recommend in the book is that instead of anticipating that a close and increasingly closer partnership with India uh, will suggest a trajectory towards some kind of alliance, we should manage our expectations and think of this much more like a joint venture in business where we've got some very core areas where we work together closely, uh, but we should understand that there are going to be some areas where we do have those differences. And as I mentioned, uh, you know, Iran is going to be an area where we have had differences in the past and we are likely to have differences in the future. Hmm. So you mentioned Iran, you mentioned Pakistan. Mm -hmm. I, I think you mentioned Pakistan. If you haven't, you might touch on Pakistan. But of course, the big country is China. India vis-a-vis -vis China, and it's you might talk about the relationship economically as well as politically as well as geopolitically in terms of the U.S. relationship. How do you see that shaping? If I could start with the China piece, because that's sure. a very important driving factor, I think, in, in it. The, the changed geopolitics with China's rise and China's increased assertiveness across this larger Asian space, including throughout the entire Indian Ocean region, I think is one reason that India and the United States have been able to come much closer together. We've got convergent interests in ensuring a balance of power throughout the larger Indian Ocean, Asia Pacific region, uh, what the Trump administration is now referring to as the Indo-Pacific. This is a term that Japan uses frequently, that the Australians use. That used in the Obama administration as well, the latter years of Obama, didn't they talk in those terms? It's very interesting. Former yeah. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton used mm -hmm. the term a few right. times. Uh, our Now he's our nominee to be uh, ambassador to Australia. Um, yeah. Our, our commander-in-chief of Pacific Command, Admiral mm -hmm. Harris, has used a term Indo-Asia Pacific. He's mm -hmm. used that very frequently to describe this larger maritime region. But the really interesting thing, I think, that has evolved in, in relatively short order is the sense that, I that India has concerns about protecting its own interests and its own influence in its neighborhood. Uh, China has very actively uh, carried out infrastructure investments throughout uh, the region. Many of the smaller countries in the region, Sri Lanka is a prime example, uh, Bangladesh, Maldives, Pakistan, there is an enormous um, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which I think is up to $62 billion in declared um, investment commitments. It's hard to know whether that all will materialize, but even if a small component of $62 billion is, is materialized in Pakistan in infrastructure investments, that's still quite something, still quite significant. China now has an active military base in Djibouti. Mm -hmm. So I think India has seen the development of this and wondered, well, how does it continue to protect its own area of influence? Uh, I think one of the results of clearly has been deeper consultation between India and the United States on these developments uh, across the region, across the geopolitical framework. You've also seen India become much more expeditionary. Hmm. In 2015, India concluded an agreement with the Seychelles for India's first ever military base, its first hmm. ever overseas military base. Now, in the last couple of weeks, that agreement has run into a little bit of a hitch due to domestic politics in the Seychelles. 
but the Indian government has not been sitting by the side. It actually negotiated an agreement with Iran, uh, Oman a couple months ago mm-hmm. for base access there. And then in March, when France's President Hollande visited India, they signed an agreement for uh, facility sharing, again, mm-hmm. uh, base access there. So you see the Indian uh, idea now that it needs to have a little bit more of a, a a presence abroad. It needs to expand its m- navy. It needs to be doing more in the maritime space. Mm-hmm. And I think that is a result of what you've seen happening but with China. But help me understand, is that to establish itself as a regional power more than to establish uh, this joint venture with the U.S.? So it's not really about U.S. foreign policy in that region. It's more about regional profile in the region. Is that is that how, I, how India is already a regional power and I think mm-hmm. it wants to ensure that it protects its own interests. Now right. to the degree the India and the United States have some area of, of, of interest and cooperation, definitely, but I think India is not looking to develop its navy and create a a, 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 a network of base Mm-hmm. facilities that it can avail of simply to partner with the United States is doing this for its own reasons. Right, right. And then just briefly, it's still on China, Alyssa, if you would, um, y- you talked about the uh, India casting a wary eye at what China's doing, including the One Belt, One Road um, plans for mm-hmm. Pakistan. But by, by the same token, India is one of the early signatories to the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, mm-hmm. the AIB. AIB is putting a lot of money, and there's been some problems with what it's done in Sri Lanka and all that. But So how do you square this position politically, geopolitically, that India, this pose India is striking, with what it's doing economically? And by the same token, there's a lot of investment across the border. Yes. So um, this, this is an important distinction. Uh, India has taken a very public stance, one of the few countries in the world that did not send an official to China's Belt and Road Summit, the mm-hmm. Belt and Road That's Forum right. that took place yeah. last May. Uh, and they had a very public um, uh, uh, statement that came mm-hmm. from the Ministry of External Affairs uh, detailing why mm-hmm. and the concerns that India has about the Belt and Road Initiative. The Belt and Road Initiative is not the same as the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, no. which is a multilateral bank with many members. The Belt and Road Initiative is also not the same as the New Development Bank, the new bank that the BRICS group, the Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa grouping, has created, cut from whole cloth, Mm -hmm. uh, wrote its first development loans in 2016. So uh, India itself has made a pretty clear distinction between what it sees as cooperation in the multilateral and the development finance space, which it is very happy to do. It partners with China multilaterally on these kinds of things. Uh, Part of it has to do with the idea that the World Bank and the IMF have not reformed as much as both India and China believe they should to better reflect the rising economic clout of these two countries. Uh, So the creation of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, to which you're absolutely right, India is the number two capital contributor and now the number (coughs) one uh, recipient of development finance. Uh, This has been something that India has been very happy to collaborate on. I actually wish the United States had become a member. All of our European and Asian allies are also members now, too, so I think we missed the boat on that. Uh, But it's very interesting. Uh, India draws a strong distinction between these multilateral collaborative ventures and what they see as the non-transparent mechanisms inherent to the Belt and Road Initiative, which is uh, the great the financing for the Belt and Road Initiative comes entirely out of Chinese banks, and it's very unclear what the financing terms are. Um, the classic example, of course, is Sri Lanka. Um, the investments that China made prior to the declaration, uh, in fact, of the Belt and Road Initiative, China was investing in developing a deep water port in a place uh, called Hambantota, which was the former president of Sri Lanka's hometown, surprise, Mm. and it turns out this deep water port is totally uneconomical, ships don't go there, Mm -hmm. There there's no revenue, Uh, the Sri Lankan government could not make its interest payments on the loan for this development project, it's not a grant, these are not freebies, it turns out these are, you know, market rate, if we know the terms at all, kinds of infrastructure loans. Uh, The government of Sri Lanka ended up trading 
uh, an equity stake in the management of that port hmm. uh, in exchange for debt relief on that project. So India has looked at that and said, you know, what is the ultimate goal of this Belt and Road Initiative? It's very different from the way the World Bank creates investment loans for developing countries. Um, so India's objections to the Belt and Road are very different from what it sees as a positive area of collaboration with many countries in designing new kinds of uh, financial tools for infrastructure development in places that really need it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's clearly a country, as you say in the book, setting its own terms mm -hmm. in terms of this positioning itself for a place at the, at the geopolitical table. Um, can it get there, and what should the U.S. be doing? And I think you devote your last chapter to that. Do you want to talk about that a little bit in terms of the U what the U.S. should or should be doing? We don't have a particularly... Um, uh, we don't have an administration in Washington that's particularly interested in global governance, but you might speak to what should be doing and then what might be possible to be done in the next two to five years, eight years. Yeah, I, I wish the administration were more interested in global governance because this is important and the world moves on and the world moves on and interacts and does things together and I uh, wish that we had a stronger voice on some of these issues. Mm -hmm. um, my whole last chapter is devoted to recommendations for U.S. foreign policy toward India. So in a sense, the, the entire last part of the book flows from the historical background that the first part of the book provides. Um, one of the recommendations I've already touched on, and that's a kind of conceptual reframing to really thinking about our government-to-government -government relationship with India as something that should be seen more like a joint venture to help insulate against the inevitable differences that we're going to have. We're, we're going to have differences, of course. Um, and it's a little bit more pronounced with a country that is extremely independent and is not interested in a traditional alliance kind of relationship. Um, I argue that that will become important in managing expectations, particularly in the defense and security realm, where ties are growing quite well. Uh, they are continuing to grow under the Trump administration, which is terrific. Uh, the administration is continuing some of the uh, initiatives that were started by the Obama administration, for example, mm -hmm. something called the Defense Technology and Trade Initiative, which is great and is continuing. Um, but, uh, you know, the defense space is a space where somebody might turn around one day and say, well, wait a minute, why are we doing X if New Delhi doesn't support us on this issue that we have with Iran? So that's why I worry about this. I think people uh, may see challenges mm -hmm. when India has its own historical foreign policy, then it's not going to necessarily change what it does because we have our own views. So that's why I spent a lot of time on the conceptual framework mm -hmm. of this. I speak quite a lot in the recommendations section about the importance of of global governance and supporting Indian membership especially. I do write about the Security Council, it's an important issue, but also many of the economic institutions of global governance, not only for reasons of global equity, but also because India's own continued rise on the world stage does depend on its ability to continue growing its economy mm -hmm. uh, and maintaining those high rates of growth and doing so over a long period. And in, in India has a lot more economic reform it could undertake, some of which is domestically, politically challenging. Mm -hmm. So better embedding India in the networks that are committed to reform and to open trade and to open investment mm -hmm. would help India better make the case at home. Because right. being better embedded with cohorts of countries that are focused on what more can be done to enhance trade and investment will position India better to be able to make the case domestically. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen this in a lot of different cases. Um, that certainly has been the case for uh, Indian membership in the global regimes that focus on non-proliferation. For three decades, India was on the outside. One of the decisions of the U.S.-India Civil Nuclear Initiative was not only to find ways to enable uh, civil nuclear energy commerce between India and the United States, but also to help support Indian membership in these four major nonproliferation regimes. And so what happened? We committed that we would help India with that. India changed their domestic laws. They changed all of their laws that dealt with governing nonproliferation, uh, uh, export controls on chemicals, uh, on nuclear commerce, uh, on technology. They are now members of the Missile Technology Control Regime. 
uh, of the Wassenaar arrangement of the Australia group. It doesn't matter if you don't know these regimes. The point is they had been on the outside of all of these for three decades. Now they're on the inside. Hmm. There's one remaining regime that India seeks membership in and has had a little bit of trouble, Mm -hmm. um, and that's the nuclear suppliers group. Uh, China has been exercising a, a, a you know, a, this is a group that governs by consensus, so China apparently has been uh, blocking Indian uh, membership there. But, mm. you know, three out of the four is not bad, and that's right. a real sea change from where things were 10 years ago. So going back to your blueprint, in effect, for a joint venture, what about the uh, Secretary of State who's in waiting, uh, the nominee, what is his feeling toward or position toward India? Do you have a sense for that? And is the State Department at least receptive? Are people in the State Department receptive to this notion of working uh, in a joint venture framework? Is there interest in that? I confess there's not a long track record of statements from Mm -hmm. uh, Secretary Pompeo, Um, nominee, uh on this question. So I don't know. Uh, I would anticipate that he would follow what has been uh, the declared foreign policy of the Trump administration. We have a declared South Asia strategy uh, from the Trump administration that the president uh, provided during a speech last August. Mm -hmm. Um, The South Asia strategy is focused on our presence in Afghanistan and trying to enhance uh, regional stability. That statement also provided a kind of high level Um, of criticism for the problem of terrorism emanating from Pakistan. Uh, That's something that I think we've heard uh, over the years from various U.S. administrations, uh, but we don't often hear it at that level of bluntness from a president. So Mm -hmm. that was Mm -hmm. something new and a little bit different. And also in that same speech, the president said we'd like to work more closely with India on economic development Mm -hmm. uh, and development assistance in Afghanistan. Um, So I would imagine that would be a component. In the national security strategy that was released by the Trump administration, uh, there is a lot of focus on the Indo-Pacific region. They use this term quite a bit. Uh, And India is a big component of the Indo-Pacific. The Indo-Pacific discussion is the first of all the regional discussions in the national security strategy. I would hope that would inform what Mm -hmm. the next Secretary of State decides to pursue Mm -hmm. uh, and take up. Certainly, I hope that it informs. I hope they don't change it at the last minute. We have a new <laughs> national security advisor, too. Um, That's right. So That's right. <laughs> but so the indications are that this administration is interested in, in working side by side with India on problems within the region. We've that definitely seen that on the and security that's reciprocated. side. We've yeah. definitely seen that on the security side. Can I take 30 seconds to yeah, just point please. out, uh, we've, we've seen some changes in the economic approach that the Trump administration is taking uh, mm-hmm. towards all countries, not just India. Um, and we've long had economic frictions with India. That won't be a secret to anybody who has worked on uh, uh, market access questions or trying to do business in India where there's many challenges. Um, anybody who's served in U.S. government mm-hmm. knows that there's always a kind of um, a lot of companies come and try to say, look, we've got this problem. Can you help? What's the, the role of the U.S. government in helping American companies? So there's a lot of concern about how challenging it can be to do business in India. Um, the Trump administration has taken up a couple different areas that have not historically been areas of focus in our economic dialogue. One of these is attention to trade deficits. Uh, clearly, the big area of focus is our trade deficit with China. But it turns out India is something like number 10 on this list of trade deficits. It's about a $26 billion a year trade deficit. So it turns out now that on our list of the many issues and concerns that exist uh, at the government-to-government dialogue on economic concerns, now there's a new element about this trade deficit. So that hasn't historically been something that rose to uh, the list of things that you would raise with the Indian government, but now it is. Um, We also have had this issue now with the imposition of tariffs on steel and aluminum. Mm -hmm. Well, this is now an issue. India has sought consultations with the United States under the World Trade Organization framework. It's another area of concern that they have. Of course, we've we've got longstanding differences with India on the question of skilled worker visas. India has taken the United States to the World Trade Organization on that count, too. That predates, of course, this administration. Mm Thing. Could could that World Trade Organization decision work against go against the United States? Could it go in favor of India? 
Which which decision? The one that's been taken on the visa, the high value visa uh, issue. I don't know how it will be decided. It's in uh-huh. panel now, um, and I don't know which direction it will go. This this uh, trade dispute was filed in 2016. Okay. Uh, so they went their way through a long process, and I and I honestly don't know which way it will go. This is uh, I wrote in the book, um, citing my colleague Ted Alden, who's an expert on trade and immigration issues. This is actually going to set a global precedent for how the world conducts services trade in terms of what's called movement of skilled persons because it will be the first time that an immigration question will be decided under the rules of a trade agreement so I would suggest for anybody who's interested in this topic just keep your eyes open for what happens with this I don't know what direction it's going to go and it will be very interesting to see so uh, we want to take some questions from the audience and I encourage you all to fill out your blue cards and send your questions up. But there's a, a question here, and this is in line with what you're talking about in terms of the um, uh, Trump administration's position vis-a-vis what's going on in India. The What's coming up on the, on the administration's agenda is the Iran uh, agreement. Yes. And you mentioned a couple of times India's position on Iran. So you might give us a little background there. What could be the Iranian or the Indian response to some decision either to continue or not to continue give us both aspects well I think certainly India like many countries will we've got President Macron who is here right now yeah. looking for a status quo on this question mm-hmm. uh, I think New Delhi would would uh, be very interested in seeing a status quo on this question and to seeing the United States remain within the framework of the Iran deal um, For India, Iran is an important historical partner. There's a long civilizational history of connectivity there. But for the immediate foreign policy context, Iran is the country through which India has overland access into Afghanistan. Now, India has been the fifth largest bilateral donor to Afghanistan for about the last 15 years or so. Uh, It has been an important infrastructure development partner, has built the external ring road uh, for Afghanistan, has built its parliament, it has done a lot of training for Afghan officials. There's a lot that India is doing in Afghanistan. Pakistan prevents India from having overland access directly into Afghanistan across the shortest route. Um, And again, this is long-standing. Um, so what India has done has been to partner with Iran to develop a deep water port in a place called Chabahar. Oh, yes. Uh, yes, Japan is also working with India on this. Mm-hmm. So if the United States backs out of the Iran deal and decides to try to move towards reimposing sanctions, that raises questions about how our partners might be affected. I don't know what will happen with this, but you can see how all of a sudden there are a series of dominoes that, you know, new questions pop up. Well, how can uh, India continue doing what the United States is asking it to do. The first wheat shipment recently went through the Chabahar port uh, overland up into Afghanistan, so it's been a demonstration of success in using this uh, supply link. Um, I think there are a lot of questions in New Delhi about what uh, the future progress of this particular um, uh, line of communication into Afghanistan would be absent mm-hmm. the stability and the status quo of maintaining the Iran deal. It, it, it just all reminds me again that India has is going at finding its seat at the table by setting its own terms. Yeah. And we really, it really is an indication of entering a multipolar world, is it not? I mean, that's a larger question, but leads me to the question here, which I'll just read. Um, given the, the questioner's point of view, given that the U.S. is now unwinding the global system it built, isn't India getting in too late? And he makes the point that Kishore Mababani was here just last week, and he was uh, talking about the drop in influence from the West, particularly the U.S., and the rise of Asia, a topic he's been talking about for some time. Yeah. What do I worry about Is India too late? I I don't think India is too late. I think India is in a process of determining um, how it wants to engage and what it wants to be part of. But what is changing uh, in the world and around India is the question of U.S. leadership. Mm -hmm. So particularly if you look at what has unfolded across the Asian region, we were deeply involved in uh, setting up the Trans-Pacific Partnership. This was an important way that the United States, with 
uh, partners across the Asia Pacific was keen to set trade rules of the road eventually thinking that other countries might want to join. Uh, India was never part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, but could have aspired to join. China was not part of the TPP, but could have aspired to join. But now we've walked away from that and created a context where, well, the remaining countries, you know, Japan actually has done a lot, leading the remaining countries to conclude their own TPP agreement, which is a little bit different than the one that uh, had, had been negotiated with the United States. So now there's a question of whether the United States would seek to rejoin or not. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we would at this point. I, I would hope, uh, should we have a, a different administration, that we would, because I do think it's an important leadership question. Um, but there is a competing trade negotiation underway in Asia that does involve China and does involve India. It's called the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Mm -hmm. Now, those negotiations are still underway and they've been underway for quite a while so I don't know that it's going to be concluded anytime soon it also is from what I understand uh, a trade agreement um, of a lesser quality meaning not as great of an opening uh, as the TPP mm -hmm. so but that does raise the question the United States is not involved in that e either so will there be uh, groupings of enhanced trade that are kind of redirecting away from deepening trade with the United States. I mean, these are these are big questions, and India is part of that. Mm -hmm. So that set of circumstances, does that make it more difficult for India to do what it intends to do, what Mr. Modi would like India to do in terms of being a geopolitical power, being having a place at the table? The circumstance of the United States having stepped out? Right, right. That, be, that being one example of that. Huh, interesting is, question. Is the, is the world changing? Is the global order of the world changing so much that India has a harder time of it now? If it had gone about this, if it had been possible to go about this, say, 10 years ago, would it have had an easier time of it? Well, India has been advocating, certainly, for a place uh, in global institutions where it does not presently have one for a mm -hmm. long time. The mm -hmm. APEC question is actually not a new question. No, right. It's just that yeah. the Indian request for membership is at least 20 years old. There was a moratorium on new membership that expired in 2010, and they have not admitted a single new member. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very interesting uh, hypothetical mm -hmm. if India had started earlier. But, I mean, it was pushing for certainly membership in these institutions of global governance. It's just that now th where its economy is, uh, is so much larger. And you see a, a more deeply engaged Indian government willing to do things that it wasn't necessarily doing mm -hmm. 15 years ago. Uh, an example is now successive US secretaries of defense pretty routinely refer to India as a net provider of regional security. Hmm. I don't think anybody would have used this term 20 years ago, but it's pretty common to hear now around Washington. Um, in 2015, when the government of Yemen collapsed, it was India that carried out the rescue of about 1,000 citizens oh, from right. 41 different countries. Mm. The United States had left. Our embassy was closed. Uh, India carried out this evacuation. India had carried out evacuations in other countries before of its own citizens, uh, but this was a little bit different, that it was conducting this evacuation for the benefit of collective regional security. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good example of where you see, see it more stepping up on, on some of these issues now. Mm -hmm. So one of the benefits, I think, of this, of this book, and I spent, I was up late last night reading it, and it is a really good read, but one of the benefits yeah. is, you, is you introduce us to so many aspects of the Indian life if you will. And you make the point in your comments tonight that India's got to keep building its economy. It's got to keep this growing really its important. keep growing its economy. To right. do that it's got to keep right. enacting its reforms. Right. It's got to keep opening up. It's got to keep at the same time it's opening up centralizing some of the um, uh, solving some of its domestic problems, which it's trying to do. I mean under the Modi administration there's been some issues uh, around, they've managed to get the GST tax through and so on. But talk a little bit about how that, what they need to do to move things, the next jump forward, to keep things growing at 7%. You've got a large population, and uh, there's got to be 
and a young population, but talk about the demographic issues, the economic issues, what it's yeah. going to take to move them forward. So uh, let me clarify that my book is a foreign policy book. It is really about India's role on the global stage, and there are many wonderful books that look at the quite significant challenges that India has domestically, whether that's uh, challenges of overcoming poverty, uh, whether it's challenges of social discrimination, uh, including gender bias, violence against women, caste discrimination, which continues to exist, problems of differences between regions in India. There are many disagreements between regions, actually. That's another issue. Um, India does face many of these challenges. It's got uh, infrastructure needs that the finance minister has estimated at $1.5 trillion over the next decade. Um, so I do talk about these issues, but I argue that I think we're going to see India as an active power on the world stage. We are already seeing some of that already. Now, for India, coming to that kind of next step up, India's ability to really play an important security role on the world stage. It's got one of the world is, world's largest military modernizations underway. It's got about the world's fifth or sixth largest defense budget, depending on what metric you use for that, two different organizations counted in different ways. Either way, it's in the top ten. It's got the third largest military by personnel strength, but it doesn't deploy in coalitions of the willing. It really only does uh, out-of-area military deployments under a UN umbrella for peacekeeping. India is one of the uh, world's largest contributors to UN peacekeeping, by the way, which is another one of the, the arguments that certainly Indian officials will make about the inequity of not having a permanent seat on the Security Council. But in order to maintain and, and continue that modernization and continue developing India internally, uh, it needs to have a larger economic base. Uh, and so, of course, nothing is guaranteed, right? I, you know, I would bet on things going well for India, if I had to bet. And I'm not actually a betting person, but that's the bet I would make. Um, but it doesn't mean that I think everything's going to be easy going. I think there's going to be bumps along the road. It's hard in a very, very diverse democracy to have things kind of flow easily. Um, you'll always have some kind of a glitch somewhere. Hard to get something passed in Parliament that's actually urgent and needs to be passed. This happens not infrequently. So uh, what India certainly needs to do and, and focus its attention on for its own position on the world stage, for its own ability to, to become that defender not only of its own national security interests, but to have that larger presence across the region uh, that it is charting its course towards developing, it does need to focus uh, in a very urgent way on maintaining and continuing economic reforms, and that's going to be hard. Some of the reforms that are still not done are some of the things that are most challenging, like reforming labor laws. Uh, in uh, you know, the, one of the examples that I use in the book is that here, here's a country with 1.3 billion people. It's a huge country. It's very populous. Um, guess what the world's number two ready-made garment exporter is? Yeah, so it's Bangladesh. So this is a country that is, you know, one-sixth, one-seventh the size of India, but it's the number two ready-made garment exporter, second only to China. It's not India. Hmm. Uh, and part of the reason for that is that uh, India has labor laws that have inhibited the formation of large factories hmm. uh, because if you grow larger than 100 employees, you have to get government permission to fire or lay people off. So that prevents, it actually disincentivizes growing. Hmm. Um, so they have a lot of informal sector, small scale uh, organizations, hmm. which doesn't necessarily lead you to becoming a global exporter in these kind of very labor intensive industries, becoming a globally competitive uh, exporter, I should say. Mm -hmm. So that's just one example. Uh, but that would be an important area for that's reform. That's very interesting yeah. because uh, Prime Minister Modi has had a Make in India initiative that has been his rallying cry on behalf of the Indian economy. Right. He does have that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an important initiative. I think people are now concerned that it has not been able to deliver what they hoped it would be able to deliver. Mm -hmm. uh, but I certainly hope that any Indian government continues on this focus. By the way, uh, the Make in India program is actually, I mean, this is the same type of uh, a program that the previous Indian government had, focusing on trying to encourage people to manufacture in mm -hmm. India. The previous Indian government, led by the Congress Party, 
had a national manufacturing policy mm -hmm. that was similarly focused on trying to increase the percentage of uh, India's manufacturing sector uh, to about 30% of GDP. So right. that to me, that actually tells me that there is a consensus on the really important things that need to be done for the Indian economy to get where people would like to go, both mm -hmm. for domestic uh, prosperity, economic transformation at home, as well as to fund and support a larger presence on the world stage. And is it happening fast enough? Because you've got 1.3 billion people and growing, right? And you've got a very young demographic. This is not happening fast enough. Not fast enough. Yeah, not fast enough. Uh, one of the issues here, of course, is uh, whether India is experiencing jobless growth or growth without the creation of the number of jobs India needs to create. It, as you mentioned, a, a very youthful demographic. India needs to be creating about a million jobs a month mm -hmm. uh, to just absorb people who come of workforce age each month. Uh, it is presently certainly not doing that. Um, it's very difficult to say precisely how many jobs are being created. There is a challenge of data insufficiency. Uh, the current Indian government is trying to develop better uh, unemployment data collection tools. They, they don't have a monthly jobs report in the same way that we have this in the United States. You kind of have a, a monthly barometer to tell you what's happening in the economy. They have lagging data sometimes that comes, you know, a year late. So it's a little mm -hmm. bit difficult to know exactly what's happening. But anecdotally, there are a lot of reports of, you know, millions of people applying for five jobs. I mean, I'm slightly exaggerating, but not by much, mm -hmm. which just shows that, that there is a lot of hunger for good, secure jobs. Um, and so this, this is a really important piece of creating that uh, prosperity for India at home. So we are uh, coming up at the end of our radio program, and I'd like to come back to the audience in just a few minutes. But Alyssa, would you like to summarize or make a final point or uh, conclude your comments for our radio audience at this point? Let me offer, I I'll do this in less than a minute. There's a section in my book that I speak about when I visit universities, and that's what I refer to as the enabling environment for learning more about India, learning more about a country mm -hmm. that is playing an increasingly uh, more active role on the world stage. If you look at the data on study abroad for American students, if mm -hmm. you look at the data on enrollment of languages in the United States, I am very sad to report that India fares quite poorly on this front. Twice as many American students study abroad in Costa Rica than decide to do so in India. Now, I don't have a prescription for what that number should look like, but I would think that it would look a little bit different than that. Mm. Um, if you look at language enrollments in the United States, uh, you've got four times the number of enrollments for Korean, for Biblical Hebrew, for Ancient Greek, than you have for all of the Indian languages combined. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't have a prescription for what that number should be mm -hmm. as a number, uh, but I would think it would look a little bit different than it does now. So I would argue that we've got a country that is doing so much, seeking to do more on the world stage, has its own cultures, history, uh, a lot that we can all learn. And I would hope that we have uh, an increased opportunity throughout the United States in our higher education space to make that possible for all Americans. Mm -hmm. And this is spoken by someone who is fluent in Hindi and Urdu, correct? Well, it's is very it? similar spoken. Yeah. yeah, but you're fluent in both and served as an interpreter both at one, at one yeah. point. Um, just a, again, as we're coming close to the end of the radio program, there's one thing that didn't come up in our discussion, and I'd like to raise it now, and that is the uh, orientation of the, of the government, the coalition government, toward Muslims and what that relationship looks like from your perspective. This is not a coalition government. This is a single You're party correct. majority, yeah, uh, right. which is quite important because it's the first time in about 30 years that there's been a yeah, single party right. majority yeah. government. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are some concerns now. Certainly, there's a lot of concerns within India um, from India's opposition parties that are very vocal on this question. Uh, but there's been some uh, incidents of violence against India's Muslim minority, um, some cases that are quite overt 
uh, in the, the way the perpetrators describe what they are doing. There was a recent case actually was quite shocking of somebody who beat to death and then set on fire uh, a Muslim man and filmed this and put it uh, on, on video for people to see. Uh, there is a lot of concern about whether this government is actively ignoring this kind of activity? Is, is it remaining silent and that sort of provides tacit consent? Um, the prime minister speaks out uh, relatively late when it comes to these kinds of concerns. When he does speak out, he says the right thing. So I'm encouraged by that. But there are concerns that he doesn't speak out enough on these quite frightening incidents that, that cause India's minority groups to feel fear. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, India is one of the world's most diverse countries. Uh, and, and the issue of violence, I should say, uh, many of you have probably seen some of the news reports about recent violence against women. Mm -hmm. This is also a concern. This is, a, this is a concern for India. It's been a concern for India. It remains one. Um, the prime minister spoke out about some of these rape cases just last Friday, a little bit late. Uh, so I think there is concern about the extent to which the government sees its charge as providing uh, protection and rights for all of its citizens mm -hmm. or whether only for some citizens. So there is, but there's a very vigorous debate in India about this question. Uh, I, I, I do not believe that this is an issue that people aren't talking about in India. In mm -hmm. fact, they're talking about it very actively. Mm -hmm. And it's very actively reported on. I mean, it's yes. a very active media yes. in India, yeah. in India as well. But uh, again, we've got just a couple minutes left, and I'll thank you appropriately, but I'll thank you now <laughs> too. But what would you like to say in terms of an American audience, how we should understand India 2018, looking forward, how, how do we orient ourselves to this country that is not, not very far away from being the most populous in the country? It is right. bills itself as the world's largest democracy. Right. What do you tell us? Uh, I think it's important for us to be able to absorb that India is, I mean, you've heard this a million times, India is many things at once. Well, when we think about both India's domestic challenges and its global activity, that is really, really true. It has been very hard in recent years, I think, for Americans to appreciate what India is doing on the world stage because it does continue to have so many problems and domestically. And what we read about often in the news is coverage of these problems. Mm -hmm. uh, and ag again, I, I think it's just absolutely important, particularly for young people who are, you know, a generation younger than me, people growing up into a world where India is a very active international presence and will become even more so. This is a place that has a lot happening and we should be able to absorb and understand all of that, both its many challenges at home and not let those overshadow what we can uh, appreciate and understand that it is doing internationally because those exist at the same time. Mm -hmm. I go to India about twice a year, sometimes three times a year, and I'm always struck how complex it is, increasingly complex, but how colorful and chaotic at the same time. Please join me in thanking Alyssa Ayers, and we'll have time for a few more questions, but please join me in thanking her now for the radio audience. Thank you. Thank you.